I V M. Ahinda na min kaya ko sa mauvi masurak na magasada. Namo mo mahasayur na parda. Obay na yakat na yasamada. Ahinda na min kaya ko sa mauvi masurak na magasada. Namo mo mahasayur na parda. Obay na yakat na yasamada. Welcome to States of Anarchy. I'm your host Hamsini Hari Haran and every week on the show I talk over issues in global affairs and foreign policy all to make a little more sense of the world. The song that you heard at the beginning of this podcast was the election theme song of Mahinda Rajapaksa, the newly elected prime minister of Sri Lanka. Last month his party, the Sri Lankan Podujana Peramuna or the SLPP, won the parliamentary election. They won a massive victory of 145 seats of the total number of 225 seats in the Sri Lankan Parliament. This marks the return of Mahinda Rajapaksa as the Prime Minister of the country. So, what does the win mean for Sri Lanka? And what does it mean for Sri Lankan economy and foreign policy? And how do minorities view it? To answer all of these questions is my guest for today, Amita Arud Pragasam. Amita is a senior assistant editor at Himal South Asian. She's previously worked as the head of research and policy at the Secretariat for Coordinating Reconciliation Mechanisms. She was the private secretary to a Sri Lankan foreign minister and a documentary filmmaker and researcher. Just a note about today's episode, because of COVID-19, all the birds and animals are out in full swing, so you might hear some bird call during the episode. We'll get to the conversation with Amita after a short break. Hey everybody, welcome to another awesome week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you're not following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. It's been a really fun week this week as it is almost every week, but this week was particularly fun. Parmesh Honey was on Cyrus Says, great conversation over there. We had a crossover event. Beneath Kanabar, host of the Storytellers and Storytellers podcast, came on Uncle Please Sit. Really interesting conversation about the future of digital content. Besides that, it was the 50th episode this week of Agla Station Adulthood. Congratulations to Ritasha and Ayushi. But yeah, they're 50 episodes down. They had Rekha Jha as the guest on that show. On Advertising is Dead, Varun had the founders of Foxy Moron, Suveer Bajaj and Pratik Gupta on. Another really, really interesting conversation. It's so full of interesting conversations this week. But with that, let's get you back to your show. Hi, Amita. Welcome to States of Anarchy. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi Om Sini thanks for having me. So the Sri Lankan elections happened recently and I think at least for me as I'm sitting in Chennai it's always interesting to see what's happening in Sri Lanka and uh this time you saw uh, Rajapaksha's party win by a huge margin. Can you break this down for us a little bit? What does this win mean for Sri Lanka? Um sure so Uh, I mean, I'd, I'd like to start by, I guess, stressing the electoral significance of this victory. So, seventy-one percent of registered Sri Lankan voters cast their ballot, and it was a relatively free and fair election. Um, you know, as you said, the Rajapaksa family and their party, the Sri Lanka Podujana Perumana, or the SLPP, won in a landslide. So, they won more seats than when Mahinda Rajapaksa went to the polls in two thousand and ten, soon after Sri Lanka's civil war ended, with a complete military victory for the government. Now that was when Mahinda Rajapaksa was assumed to be at the height of his popularity, and that that kind of uh, popularity has now been surpassed. So, uh, with close allies, the SLPP managed to secure 150 seats in parliament, which gives them uh, a two-thirds supermajority. But in terms of interpreting this result, it really depends, I think, on who you talk to. So, the election victory is going to mean very different things if you're a minority. versus if you are part of the singular buddhist majority community it's going to mean something different if you believe in the virtues of democracy and freedom of expression versus you know if you don't mind if the country is governed like the ccp governs china so i think broadly you know the election victory is going to weaken constitutional safeguards for democracy including the separation of powers between the legislature uh, executive and judiciary and it's also going to weaken the independence of some national oversight bodies so i mean that's already part of the mandate of this new government to abolish the 19th amendment to the constitution which actually introduced 
checks on executive power and strengthen the independence of those oversight bodies that I mentioned. The election victory will possibly also result in greater centralization of power. So, you know, there is a, a lot of de debate and discussion at the moment about whether or not the 13th Amendment will be eliminated. And that's an amendment which guarantees devolution to the provinces. So there's a lot of constitutional changes that are going to happen as a result of this election victory. And given what we know already about um, the Rajapaksa's style of governance, I think national security is going to be a top priority for this government. And, you know, often this translates into no dissent tolerated, even at the risk of human rights violations. We've already seen crackdowns on dissent. We've seen human rights violations as well. So we've had the arrest without charge of a human rights lawyer, Hejaz Hezbollah, the arrest without charge of Ramzi Razik, and intimidation, uh, you know, great intimidation of journalists, including uh, New York Times journalist Darisha Bastians. And we've even seen, you know, the activists who have represented the relatives of the forcibly disappeared over many decades, um, facing greater intimidation and surveillance. Along with, you know, this kind of no dissent tolerated approach, um, I think it will be uh, likely that the rate of militarization, which is already quite rapid in the last uh, several months since Mahinda Rajapaksa's brother, Gotabaya Rajapaksa, was elected as president. It's already been rapid. It's going to probably increase in pace. But on the positive side, so I said, you know, as I said before, it really depends on who you talk to in terms of what this means for Sri Lanka. I think some people are expecting to see more stability, less infighting, which means coalition frictions and policy stagnation is not going to be a problem with uh, the Rajapaksa kind of family dictating or, or determining policy. I think they kind of operate uh, much more uh, smoothly um, in terms of determining policy and governance. And, you know, of course, we'll see this kind of decisive governance style, which uh, they have maintained in the last nine months, a type of governance that elevates a singular Buddhist community, um, that sees a clergy playing a more prominent role in governance. Yeah, so I, again, you know, it really depends on who you talk to within Sri Lanka, but um, there will be some broad erosion of Sri Lanka's democracy, I believe. Okay, that's a lot to unpack, I think. I'm just wondering, as you spoke, I have a couple of questions. One is that you spoke about the Rajapaksha style of governance and the possible weakening of legislature and judiciary and greater centralization and greater militarization. Now, the first that I would wonder is why would Sri Lanka need to militarize? Because the civil war is over, therefore you, I, I don't know, maybe this is just like an outsider's naivete. So why would Sri Lanka need to militarize is the first. And the second would be, these worries are exactly what got them voted out in the last parliamentary elections, right? So what changed in the public mindset that it brought the SLPP back um, to the seat of parliament with an even bigger majority? Why does Sri Lanka need to militarize? I don't think Sri Lanka needs to militarize. Sri Lanka, um, you know, actually already spends a large amount of money on uh, defense. Um, we spend, we have, a, you know, Compared to the rest of the region, we actually have um, an army which is quite outsized and greater military spending compared to most of our, our peers, if you, you know, uh, proportion that according to our uh, size. And, you know, the fact that we don't have a war going on anymore, as you very rightly pointed out, means we should be shrinking kind of the presence of our military and the amount we spend on our military, but that's not happening. We don't need to militarize, but um, I think that is the governance style that we can expect to see, given um, that the president, Gotabaya Rajapaksa, a former defense secretary, has very good relations with the military. He has very close links to members of the military. Um, so that's just a trend that we're going to see. It's also part of his like decisive, top-down kind of mode of governance, I think. You'd mentioned that what... Um the SLPP's new rule could usher in is a weakening of legislature and judiciary and uh, possibly greater centralization. Mm. And what I thought of was these were sort of the same platforms that got, it, got, that got them voted out in the last elections. Mm -hmm. So what changed in the public mindset that they came back with even bigger a majority? 
Yeah, so I mean, a lot of things have changed uh, since 2015 when the Good Governance Coalition kind of was voted in. I think most notably, there's been a lot of infighting between the members, the, the political leaders um, who were heading the coalition. And, you know, that's actually led to the decimation of the opposition party. So the United National Party, which has been the election vehicle for Ranil Vikramasinghe, you know, only managed to secure one seat in the recent parliamentary elections. That's been kind of a resounding message from voters. They don't want to see this kind of infighting anymore. They're really tired of policy stagnation. And, you know, in that sense, voters are frustrated. There was a lot, actually, that the good governance coalition promised to voters that they weren't able to fulfill because of coalition infighting. In addition, there was visible corruption among some members of the Good Governance Coalition, notably a bond scandal. The SLPP really capitalized on that. So the media was actually overwhelmed with the story to the extent that it was all that people talked about in Sri Lanka. And in political communication, if you repeat a message enough times, people will begin to hear it uh, organically. And really with such effective political communication by the SLPP, Sri Lankans start to really associate the entire good governance movement with this, you know, undoubtedly terrible act of corruption. Um, that did the, the coalition government a lot of damage, especially given, you know, the kind of economic conditions in general. Ranil Vikramasinghe, the prime minister, had the opportunity to be decisive about it and to disassociate himself from the individuals associated with the corruption scandal, but he didn't. And that further fed into the idea that the United National Party was accommodating corrupt politicians uh, and filled with cronyism. Some analysts think that the government may have gone too far in terms of their reconciliation agenda, but I do think that had there been better leadership within the Good Governance Coalition and uh, had the UNP been a little bit more decisive about corruption within their own party, there may have been more political capital with which to carry through that ambitious reconciliation agenda. I think also, um, secondly, I think you need to really think about uh, the victory of uh, the recent parliamentary election victory in terms of um, what I think about as a rally around the flag effect. So, you know, in crises, people actually reward dominant leaders who take quick and aggressive action. But, you know, we've seen this all across the world. Incumbent populist leaders have seen their popularity spike uh, as their electorates rally around the flag. But, you know, contrast that with a weak opposition with lots of infighting, a lot of indecisiveness, poor communications. And I think, you know, it, it makes sense in a way how uh, the Rajapaksas have really managed to uh, capitalize on frustration amongst voters. Um, add that to, you know, the Easter bomb attacks uh, in April, where, uh, you know, uh, that was a result of an intelligence failure in the government, so in, um, amongst the uh, uh, coalition government members. So, you know, the, gov the previous government has been seen to be extremely ineffective. They have not been seen to be taking national security and making it a priority as they should have been. I think all of these factors have really led to a change in the public mindset. That's very interesting. Now that we're discussing um, the Good Governance Party, just going back to the 2015 elections a little bit, they were considered sort of a unique turning point because I'm, I'm not sure, at least looking from the outside, if anyone imagined that they would come into power. Um, you'd mentioned that there were a lot of promises that they could not fulfill. So what did the government get right and what did they get wrong? And could you tell us more about the infighting that happened within the party? Yeah, sure. So um, let's start with uh, what they got right. So, you know, I've talked about the 19th Amendment that was introduced to curtail the powers of the president. It was a mandate given to the 2015 coalition that they managed to, you know, achieve. So the separation of powers, they strengthened the independence of national oversight bodies such as the Election Commission, the Public Service Commission, the Police Commission. They introduced the Right to Information Act, uh, which is uh, very progressive, um, introducing transparency into um, understanding government affairs. There was a lot more media freedom, so exiled journalists were allowed to return to Sri Lanka. Restrictions on foreign media personnel visiting the country were lifted. Journalists were able to travel freely to all parts of the country. 
they did some, uh, you know, they made some progressive steps in terms of introducing greater gender equality. So there was a mandatory 25% quota for women in local government, for example, which was quite good. You know, in terms of foreign policy, Sri Lanka was previously seen as a pariah state, but the new government was able to drastically improve relations between Sri Lanka and countries like India and advanced economies in the West. They, I think, you know, this is something that is uh, open to debate, but I think uh, they did a decent job in terms of economic policy as well. So over the last few years, I think they did a decent job because, you know, the government was supported by an IMF program and managed to actually reduce its debt burden. It reduced its independence on international capital markets as well. And, you know, ran a non-trivial surplus for the first time in 2017, which was repeated again in 2018 and 2019, despite the Easter tax. You know, so they did quite a lot in terms of constitutional reform, uh, increasing media freedom, improving gender equality, and also maintaining a strong, a relatively strong economic policy. And along with that, they managed to achieve some reconciliation targets, I think. So um, it wasn't just like symbolic, uh, but low cost reconciliation milestones that they achieved. So, for example, in 2015, the government started including the Tamil national anthems as a song to be sung on Independence Day as a means of achieving reconciliation with the Tamil minority. But also they you know, managed to introduce an office of missing persons and office of reparations, which are kind of harder to achieve given single Buddhist sentiment in the country. So they made some progress with ethnic reconciliation as well. So, I mean, I think they did quite a bit. What they did wrong was, of course, not communicating half of this to people in the country. Wow, that's such a pity in so many ways. But I think there's also sort of a trend of nationalistic governments that are coming into power all over the world, not just in Sri Lanka. So this could also be part of a larger global trend in that sense. Yeah, absolutely. As I mentioned earlier, in the aftermath of the COVID-19 crisis, populist leaders have seen a surge in their popularity as their electorates rally around the flag. But this trend towards strongman leaders is a long-standing global one uh, and not obviously just a reaction to this crisis. Um, and you mentioned earlier the presidential election earlier last year and uh, how that brought in Gotabaya Rajapaksa. So how, what role did that have exactly? Was it sort of an indication that things were going to shift towards the Rajapaksas or did it rather push voters into believing that uh, the SLPP would be a better party to be in rule? So, I mean, I think uh, ordinarily in Sri Lanka uh, and probably in other countries as well, but definitely in Sri Lanka, parliamentary victories um, tend to follow presidential election victories. And that's for a few reasons. So, you know, the, the winning party's voter base and its party activists are kind of energized by electoral success. And you have supporters then being lured towards a new power base in anticipation of political patronage. Um, and, you know, uh, that's not a small uh, thing in times of hardship, uh, economic hardship, when, you know, like uh, the incentives of future employment or networking opportunities or corporate favor, those are pretty attractive and, and large incentives. You know, so in that sense, the SLPP was riding on the momentum of uh, Gotabaya Rajapaksa's November 2019 presidential election victory. But more importantly, public sentiment has been changing for a while. Cohabitation was difficult because good governance members represented such diverse ideological perspectives. And uh, the infighting among the good governance coalition members started almost as soon as they were elected and quickly became unsustainable. The public relations impacts of the corruption scandal within the UNP or the United National Party were felt in Sri Lanka much earlier than uh, the 2019 presidential election. In fact, the shift in public sentiment was recorded in a 2018 local government election. And on February 10th, 2018, which is the date of this election, the Podujana Perumana Party won 239 out of 340 contests. So you already saw public sentiment rapidly shifting around the beginning of 2018. Um, you know, that was further consolidated by the presidential election victory, of course. And uh, more recently in the... Um, uh, in the August 5th election. So, you know, we've seen this, this shift towards or rather back uh, towards um, the Rajapaksas and the SLPP. And, you know, although Mahindra Rajapaksa did secure less votes in the 2018 local government election, 
compared to, let's say, the 2015 presidential election, where the Rajapaksas and their election vehicles lost out to Mr. Sirisena and the Good Governance Coalition, it was still a victory for him. You know, he then came in uh, and said that he thought that the current national government had lost its legitimacy and should resign. And that kind of signaling to voters and, and, you know, to the party activists is really enough to generate the kind of momentum I talked about. Mm. But, you know, I, I, again, I don't think we should overdetermine the impact of moving public sentiment. There were clearly a lot of other factors that lent themselves to this election victory. I mentioned infighting, but there was a lot more as well that was going on. Okay, that's interesting. And this makes me wonder, since we're talking about sort of public sentiment so much, um, you you see the extreme right, um, particularly in Sinhala Buddhism, becoming more prominent. So what does this election tell us about Sinhala Buddhism and its place in Sri Lankan politics? Well, Sinhala Buddhism has always played an important role in Sri Lankan politics, which has been a a mainstay of Sri Lankan politics, has actually uh, lent itself to ethnic conflict in the country. But, you know, with this election, the government is likely to interpret their mandate as a a mandate to consolidate singular Buddhism, you know, in an otherwise ethnically diverse country. Um, That was symbolized by Mahinda taking oaths at a Buddhist temple, like his brother did when he became president in November last year. So it's very clear that the Rajapaksas see one of their uh, mandates as a a mandate to consolidate singular Buddhism. What we've also seen in this election is that singular Buddhist ultranationalists have been empowered, including with a parliamentary seat. Um, This election for a singular Buddhist party associated with anti-Muslim hate speech. Now that's, you know, these kinds of radical singular Buddhist elements, having more prominence, having a parliamentary presence means that policies that actually pander to this uh, radical element are going to be easier for the Rajapaksas to take or to implement rather. So, you know, the Rajapaksas have even been talking about a new constitution in Sri Lanka, and that could very well or like very likely consolidate this ethnocracy within a constitutional framework. It just gets me wondering, as someone who's again looking in from the outside, um, with the end of the civil war, and a lot of the reconciliation that is supposed to take place, wouldn't you imagine that that would sort of curb Sinhala Buddhism extremism or did it rather work the other way around in sort of driving fear and insecurity that another civil war could possibly take place? The country isn't ready to fully confront all that went on and all its kind of its legacy of ethnic discrimination. Uh, That much is clear given this election victory. Okay. And what about um, minorities and and their role in this election? Do we know how they voted? Do we know what problems they will continue to face? Yeah. So I think the election saw a fragmentation of the Tamil polity. Uh, We saw the dominant Tamil National Alliance losing almost 40% of its parliamentary presence. So in 2010, the the Tamil National Alliance or the TNA secured 14 seats. In, In 2015, it secured 16 seats. Uh, So it was doing better. And then in 2020, uh, which is in the recent election, it only secured 10 seats. Now, this fragmentation of the Tamil polity is quite a significant event in Tamil politics. So some of those votes went to other Tamil nationalist parties. But importantly, some of the minority parties' vote share was actually captured by SLPP-aligned parties. And the SLPP, which is uh, the Rajapaksa's election vehicle, managed to make inroads in electorates like Jaffna and Batiklo. So I think that's quite significant. So I think it would be wrong to interpret this vote to mean that minorities in the North and East are pro-Rajapaksa. I think it would also be wrong to interpret the vote to mean that minorities no longer want to achieve uh, their long-standing demands for devolution and greater autonomy via constitutional reform. So for context, a significant part of the Tamil National Alliance's campaign revolved around securing greater political rights for their voters. What I think it does mean is that increasingly Tamils are coming to the conclusion that it may not be possible at this juncture to secure their political rights through parliamentary politics. Uh, I think one fact to remember is that many Tamils who could afford to migrate overseas left the country. Many Tamils who remain can't afford to leave. And the North and East are today among the most impoverished provinces in the country. 
Tamil voters seem to be saying to me that they want to use their vote to secure jobs and better livelihoods. They don't want to vote for parties that fail to address these concerns. And, you know, in the interim, the livelihoods of um, many minority communities have been devastated by several years of war. So people are looking to vote for candidates that can credibly promise economic development and jobs. So, you know, uh, I think uh, there has been a shift, a remarkable shift in the thinking of Tamil and Tamil voters. You know, the Muslim minority is a different story. But I think it would be unwise to interpret that too hastily as well. Before we get to the uh, Muslim minorities, I'm just wondering, for those of us who have sort of basic knowledge of the structure of um, Sri Lankan policy and politics, how does minority voting figure in the larger elections? Does Sri Lanka have a federal system where um, regional parties or yeah, that regional or minority parties have a big enough voice to influence national politics? The Tamils and the Muslims are numerical minorities in Sri Lanka. About 15% of the country is Tamil and about 9% is Muslim. They are concentrated in the northeast of Sri Lanka and in the upcountry regions, and most speak the Tamil language. Uh, districts in the northern and eastern regions always deliver Tamil or Muslim parliamentarians as a result. Historically, northeastern Tamils have voted for the Tamil National Alliance Party, giving that party a lot of negotiating power amongst southern political actors, especially southern parties attempting to form coalitions. But as I mentioned earlier, they are now also voting for other parties like the Tamil Congress or the Elam People's Democratic Party. The Muslims also tend to vote for parties like the Sri Lanka Muslim Congress or the All Ceylon Muslim Congress, parties that uh, represent interests emerging out of their ethnic identity. Okay, and now coming to sort of the Muslim minority, uh, how are they sort of different from other minorities in Sri Lanka or are they different from other minorities in Sri Lanka? And uh, how, how did this election fare for them? The Muslim and Tamil ethnic groups have distinct histories, cultures and religions. Um, though the Tamils practice Hinduism and Christianity, the Muslims predominantly practice Islam. Most Muslims and Tamils speak the Tamil language, although Muslims in the South will also speak Sinhalese. The Muslim political parties were able to hold on to their seats, either in coalition with Southern political parties or as separate entities. But arguably, fragmentation within the Muslim polity occurred much earlier than in the Tamil polity. Okay, that's interesting. I want to move a little bit. And you'd spoken earlier about um, the rally around the flag effect. And I thought that was very interesting because I was remembering of um, diversionary theory in international politics, where they talk about how often leaders are able to capture um, national sentiment by creating this rally around the flag effect and also by directing some of the public sentiment against usually an external actor. And that makes me wonder about Sri Lanka's foreign policy. At different points in time, the Rajapaksas have supported and they've complained against both India and China, who are now major players in the region. What do you think will be sort of the main issues in Sri Lankan foreign policy now that the SLP have won? So just to give you some background, prior to 2015, the Rajapaksa uh, regime's uh, foreign policy was actually quite isolationist. Um, There was a lot of international pressure on the Rajapaksas to abide by human rights, um, to investigate war crimes. Um, In 2013, for example, Canada, Mauritius and India boycotted the Commonwealth heads of government meeting that was held in Sri Lanka. And they were citing um, they cited the country's human rights record. So in response to this kind of international pressure, I think that government then uh, decided at some point that certain alliances were too costly. And as a result, they maybe not uh, necessarily by choice, but they started to align more closely with China and uh, pivot away from dependence on the West and India. Now, in recent years, we've had a lot of shifts in the global uh, world order, right? So we've seen, um, as you mentioned earlier, a rise of authoritarianism with President Donald Trump, increased authoritarianism with the rise of China as a global power, with leaders such as Prime Minister Modi in India. And I think in that climate, what it means is that the Rajapaksas can pursue their brand of ethnocratic nationalism with less human rights scrutiny. But, you know, they will still have to maintain certain allies, you know, that perhaps they could have afforded to isolate previously 
because of the need for economic diplomacy um, and because of the need for um, economic allies. So in that sense, the US and India will really maintain negotiating power with Sri Lanka in significant ways. So it's impossible to imagine complete Western disengagement in Sri Lanka in practice, even though that might be the Rajapaksa rhetoric going forward, because uh, the US the UK and Europe, they're all Sri Lanka's top export destinations. And, you know, cutting them off would be extremely costly for Sri Lanka, which really needs to depend on the growth of its export sector. And, you know, I think they might have learned from their previous stint in government, you know, because in 2010, the EU suspended Sri Lanka's preferential trading status on the basis of human rights abuses. But, you know, that was devastating because it really impacted Sri Lankan exports, garment exports, and so on. So, I mean, I think, you know, despite all the rhetoric, I think a lot will actually stay the same, even though human rights will be a less significant factor in terms of determining foreign policy. Sri Lanka will have to maintain some of its previous allies for reasons of uh, economic diplomacy. It's very interesting that you brought up sort of economic diplomacy, because during this time, since 2015, we've also saw that Sri Lanka was unable to pay back China for the Hamban Tota port. And we were looking at what that means for the port itself and larger geopolitics. Um, And that's something that Indians closely follow. But it just makes me wonder, how does that affect public sentiment towards China? Or do we know how public sentiment is towards India or towards China? First of all, I think there's a bit of a, this debt trap story is a bit misrepresented in terms of the global media. So Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, Sri Lanka actually owes more to US investors than it does to China. So the last time I checked in 2018, loans from Chinese banks only account for 10% of Sri Lanka's overseas debt. You know, but a lot of our debt is actually owed to international markets. So that's, I think, a a little bit of a myth. And also, you know, it's not just China, but also uh, India as well has, you know, built certain white elephants in Sri Lanka. So, you know, of course, uh, the Chinese funded the Hamban Tota Port, Marthala Airport, the Lotus Tower. And these are really horrible projects because, you know, they cost so much and they don't really provide much uh, return for the country, for Sri Lanka. We have an Indian funded train from Mana to Madhavachia that is only used by 200 people, but that railway line costs a tremendous amount. So I think, you know, the debt story is something that has been really blown up a little bit because of the kind of US-China trade war. But I think, you know, sentiment towards China within Sri Lanka is frankly a little bit xenophobic. So, you know, you have some Sri Lankans actually taking a very uncritically xenophobic view towards Chinese engagement with the country. But, you know, I think at the end of the day, Sri Lanka needs to take control of its own decisions. It has to take responsibility for its own decisions and its own investments. So if it's funding white elephants, that's not a result of China imposing a white elephant on Sri Lanka. It's also a result of Sri Lanka not really thinking about its economic policy and not really making decisions for Sri Lanka. So, you know, of course, other larger economic powers are always going to be better resourced, better able to negotiate contracts. But Sri Lanka needs to start taking accountability for um, some of its own decisions, including, and I mentioned this earlier, but including some of the way in which it it, uh, borrowed on international capital markets. And now that's something that, it really needs to take accountability for because I think it's at the uh, it's one of the reasons Sri Lanka is in the economic situation that it is in today. So you know it, it borrowed liberally from international capital markets in foreign currency um, at high interest rates with low maturity for low productivity construction and import consumption, and that has really uh, that was you know during the Rajapaksa government's previous. Uh, stint in government. And I think we really need to think about what is good for Sri Lanka and assess its economic policy uh, on that basis. And in that sense, Sri Lanka has made bad decisions for Sri Lanka. It's not that China has made bad decisions for Sri Lanka. No, I think it's very important that you raise that because it's so easy to think in binaries of saying, oh, India or China or the US. Um, But we forget that um, these were decisions taken by policymakers uh, keeping certain 
viewpoints and certain ideologies in mind sometimes. Um, and it brings me sort of to the Sri Lankan economy now that we're talking about it. Uh, considering COVID-19 and that it's set in motion uh, a recession all over the world, what do you think are the main issues that the new government will need to tackle? You know, I think you got it really spot on when you said that the crisis is economic in nature. I think uh, the main challenge for this government is going to be managing the ongoing economic crisis. And I say it's ongoing because there is a lot of hesitation amongst Sri Lankans and amongst observers to say that there is an economic crisis. And, you know, I think that thousands of layoffs have already occurred. You know, the ADB already predicts that Sri Lanka's growth rates are going to drop by 6.1% in 2020. Like, you know, if you want another story, I think in May, uh, three women were killed in a stampede just to receive financial handouts. So, you know, it's an ongoing economic crisis that Sri Lanka needs to manage, and it is already here. So it is going to be the major challenge for the SLPP going forward. So, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has certainly resulted in an economic slowdown that was, you know, also exacerbated by floods, by droughts, by a constitutional coup, um, by the Easter bombings. And, you know, it's also caused uh, a global and it's caused certain shocks in terms of supply and demand, both globally and domestically. And, um, you know, it's put Sri Lanka's key foreign exchange earners, tourism, garments, tea, migrant remittances under a lot of pressure. But the fundamentals that were in place before the COVID-19 pandemic actually started were already really poor. The economic crisis, which is the primary thing that the SLPP is going to have to manage going forward, was already in the making even before the Good Governance Coalition came into power in 2015. Protectionist policies in 2004, a string of white elephant investments with no returns, excessive borrowing on international capital markets, and a lack of economic reform have all contributed to today's crisis. I think uh, in Sri Lanka, we often associate crisis with violence. So, uh, you know, whether that's anti-Muslim rioting in Alkama or Black July in 1983 when Tamils were killed on the streets, that's what we think of as crisis in Sri Lanka. It's harder for us to wrap our heads around an economic or financial crisis because it doesn't really happen overnight or in a single event. But in any case, that's a kind of slow moving crisis Sri Lanka and the uh, SLPP are going to have to face going forward. So I think that's something that that is going to be really challenging for the government to tackle. Okay, uh, this is just one for the last question that I ask you. And it makes me wonder now that we have this new government that's in personally what do you sort of hope for the future and what are you fearful of i really do hope that you know uh, there are uh, that the the government doesn't go back to um its previous style of governance uh, in which human rights violations were common my fear is that the current opposition will not be able to uh, transform itself into uh, something more genuinely pluralistic and will engage in ethnic outbidding. And, uh, you know, Sri Lanka's history tells us anything. It tells us that this kind of ethnic outbidding is something that will lead to ethnic conflict in the country. It's happened so many times before. So many cycles of, of ethnic violence have been perpetrated by uh, majoritarian ethnic outbidding. So my fear is that there will be some form of ethnic conflict in the country. Um, I think at this time, uh, the Muslim minority is extremely vulnerable given the kind of recent mounting anti-Muslim hatred that we've seen uh, since 2013, perpetrated or you know incited by uh, some of the ultra-nationalist singular Buddhist groups that we now see in parliament. My hope is that the government uses their kind of two-thirds majority and their recent electoral victory to really you know bring about some kind of peace and, and, and really security, which is meaningful in the country. Um, thank you, Amita. This is my last question for you. Uh, and this is something that I ask all of my guests, but what are books or what are resources that you would recommend for anybody who wants to read more about um, Sri Lankan politics? Um, that's that's a, a good question. I think, um, you know, I really like Buddhism Transformed by Gananath Obisekra and Richard Gombrich. Uh, Sri Lanka in the Modern Age by Neera Vikramasinghe, anything written by Stanley Thambaya for social anthropology. 
um, in terms of resources, uh, think tanks uh, in Sri Lanka that you should follow if you're not already include Verite Research, the Center for Policy Alternatives, the International Center for Ethnic Studies, um, Adi Alam in the North. Um, and in terms of fiction and film, I think, you know, some of the novels that are kind of underrated in Sri Lanka include uh, Kalambu by Karl Muller. He writes a lot about Sri Lanka's burger community and has, you know, an amazing trilogy as well. Um, in terms of film, mm -hmm. I would uh, highly recommend Silence of the Courts in August Sun by Prasanna Vitanage, um, Ini Avan, uh, Me Magasandai by Asoka Handagama, and The Forsaken Land by Vimukti Jayasundra. Okay, that is a formidable reading list. I feel like I need to get started right away. But thank you so much, Amitra. Thank you for coming on the show and for sharing all of your insights. Thank you so much for having me. That's it for this episode of States of Anarchy. Thank you for staying with us all the way till the end. Amita's books, films, and research recommendations are all in the episode description as usual. So do go and check those out. You can also follow her on Twitter at A-A-R-U-D-P-R-A. -A if you have any questions or comments, you can reach out to me at Hamsni H on Twitter and States of Anarchy on Instagram. Every Friday, we organize a mini quiz on our Instagram page. So do come and test out your knowledge of the world. States of Anarchy is supported by the Takshashila Institution and the Independent Public Spirited Media Foundation, or IPSMF. And we're super grateful to them for their support. We're also grateful to you, dear listener, for tuning in week after week. If you want to help us reach more people, please leave us a rating on iTunes or any other podcast app you use so that more people can discover us. You can listen to States of Anarchy on the IVM podcast app or whatever you're using right now to listen to me. We'll be back soon. Namaste, I am Saurabh Chandra. And I am Pranay Kutistan. When the door is finished, we will solve the problems of the world's problems in the world. So, it will be a big deal. Now, the people of today's apartment will never see the problems of the world. But you can understand the feeling. तो आइए शामिल हो जाइए हमारी पुलिया बाजी में जहाँ प्रणय और मैं एक से एक इंटरेस्टिंग टॉपिक्स की तह तक जाएंगे आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस बिटकॉइन पाकिस्तान मेडिकल एजुकेशन करेंसी क्राइसिस कभी हम दोनों के साथ और अक्सर स्पेशल एक्सपर्ट गेस्ट की कंपनी में सुनिए हमें आई की वेबसाइट ऐप या अपने फेवरेट पॉडकास्टिंग प्लेटफॉर्म आरोप हर दूसरे हफ्ते Are you looking for India's most awesome cricket podcast? Are you now tired of listening to the same old guys drone on about cricket everywhere? Edges and Sledges is a weekly cricket podcast hosted by three fans of the game, Varun, DJ, and myself, Ashwin. It was established in early 2018, has over 60 episodes now, and is of course now proud to be on the IVM Podcast Network. Each week, we get together from three different time zones, the USA, the UK, and Singapore, and we talk about things from the world of cricket, with a focus on Indian cricket. We often interview special guests from all around the world, including former cricketers and cricket media personalities. So check out Edges and Sledges, the cricket podcast, now on the IVM Network. <laughs>